grace is greater. No matter what you've done, no matter what's been done to you, grace is greater. Grace is powerful enough to erase your guilt. Grace is big enough to cover your shame. Grace is real enough to heal your relationships. Grace is strong enough to hold you up when you're weak. Grace is sweet enough to cure your bitterness. Grace is satisfying enough to deal with your disappointment. Grace is beautiful enough to redeem your brokenness. Grace is always greater, no matter what. Well, it's great to see you here this morning as we begin a new sermon series, Grace is Greater. And we're going to be taking a look at grace as in different parts of our lives and how that relates to us. Uh, but before we do that, before we begin this morning, let's bow our heads and pray together. <clears throat> we praise you, Lord. We give you thanks that you are here with us this day in your Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts and our minds. Help us as we take seriously this task of listening to the Scripture this morning and the teachings of your Son that your spirit might speak to us and that we might listen to what it has to say. Our hearts might be changed. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I was gone last week and my wife and I, we were down on a little island that was about, well, at most about five miles wide by about 20 miles uh, long. Uh, not a very big place. And uh, it's kind of an interesting island. It, they actually spoke four different languages uh, on that island, uh, Dutch, English, Spanish, and in this native language called Papamiento, uh, and uh, which is kind of a mix of all those things plus a native language as well. And I was trying to listen to some of them and trying to pick up some of the words that they were using. And so uh, at one point, one of them says, ajo. And I said, oh, I've got a little bit of Spanish. I know ajo. Anybody know what ajo means in Spanish? It means garlic. And I thought, what, what are they talking about, about garlic? You know, and, and so I thought I knew what they were saying uh, until one of them goes like this, ajo. Aho, and I go like, no, 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 aho is by. Okay, well, I, I thought I knew what the word meant, but I, I really didn't. Uh, and I think that's the way it is with us in the word grace. We, we think that we know what the word means, and we study it, maybe we try to understand it, but understanding it really ex and experiencing it are something completely different and really understanding it at its depth. And so what I want to do over the next few weeks is just Go back and revisit that again because sometimes it gets so familiar to us. We sing it so many times. We hear the word used in various settings that sometimes we kind of get used to it and we lose the real meaning of it. You know, uh, one of the things about understanding what grace is, it's kind, of, it's kind of tricky because in order to understand what grace is, you have to bring in some other things as well. You have to bring in not only grace, but you have to bring in sin and also Jesus as Savior. Uh, for instance, that's what I have to do when I baptize somebody. I have to ask him, first of all, do you repent of your sin? And then I ask him, do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior? And the third question is, do you trust in his grace? So all those things are they're put together. The other problem with grace is it's uh, tricky because you can kind of understand it in some ways, but it's not the same thing as experiencing it, because really it's when you experience it that you understand it. Now, let me just give you an example. If you go back this afternoon and look in the Old Testament, uh, you'll go back in the book of the prophet Isaiah, in the sixth chapter of Isaiah, he talks about his experience of grace. And he says that one day he is lifted up in this vision into the heavenly presence of God, and there in the heavenly presence of God, the immediate thing that comes out of his mouth is a confession, and the confession is this, I, I the prophet, he says, am a man of unclean lips. And not only that, but I live in the midst of a people of unclean lips. He says, we're all, we're all in this. We're all struggling in this. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live in the midst of unclean, uh, people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the king. In other words, in the presence of God, that's when we really understand who we truly are. And it's at that point it says that an angel of God takes some tongs and goes over to the altar right there before God, picks up a coal and touches his mouth, and he says, you're clean, you're forgiven. Because... When our sin is revealed, and it's really from God, and it's not just a kind of a personal opinion, there's always God's grace that's there with it, and His forgiveness and mercy for us. Now, that's a kind of a way of looking at it in generally, the kind of trickiness, but if you take it from the general and you pull it into the personal, into your own individual life, we kind of resist what uh, God is trying to say to us because, well, uh, because we say things like, you know, okay, I, I guess I've sinned, but I haven't really sin sinned, sinned. 
you know. I mean, uh, for instance, uh, in this little island that my wife and I were at last week, uh, at one point, so we, get into the, we, get there, we get to the airport and we get into the taxi, and the taxi is driving us to a hotel, and he starts talking to us about, you know, this, this island, and man, he's selling the island, right, big time. He's talking to us about all the wonderful things of the island, and he says, now, you need to understand, of course, that, that this island was historically a, a property of the Netherlands, uh, and we're still connected to the Netherlands, and like the Netherlands in Amsterdam, uh, there's like this red light district, and oh, by the way, the east side of the island has been designated as the red light area of the island, to which my wife immediately responds, we're not going to that side of the island. <laughs> but a lot of times what we do is like, oh, I, I may be by my problems, but I'm not like those persons. And we try and kind of cover up our own brokenness. Sometimes it's just like we, we resist it because, you know, we just don't want to admit that, yeah, maybe we're sick too. Anybody ever, like, struggle admitting that you're ill? You know, uh, again, this last week, I, I uh, was getting ready to go on this trip with my wife, you know, and New Year's Day came around, and I thought, you know, I'm a little congestion, yeah, but I'm okay, you know, and then Thursday came around, well, I'm feeling a little weak, well, but I'm okay, Friday, well, I'm, 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 I guess I'm okay, yeah. Uh, and then Saturday came around 6 a.m. We get to the airport and we head out. And, and by the time we get down to where we're going, I'm, I, said, I said to my wife, now this is something I rarely say to her. I think I might need to go to the doctor. But I, oh, I'm okay. And I get down there into this little island. And Monday morning, I, I think I better, you know, I, I, I might be sick. Hard to believe. I think I need to see a doctor. The doctor comes up and yeah, really, the doctor comes up and examines me and says, "Well, you've got a serious case of bronchitis. You really need some help here." But we resist, don't we? That we might be sick, and that we're involved in a—I guess I'd call it a spiritual pandemic—that everyone in the world is infected with. But there is a cure. That's why at one point the Apostle Paul says this, sin may be great, but grace is greater. Grace is greater than the difficulties that we struggle with. Grace is greater than our weaknesses. Grace is greater than the things in our lives that we would just like to forget about. Grace is greater than the biggest mistakes and the biggest secrets that we have. Grace is greater. Greater than it all. That's grace. Grace is not about do, it's about done it's not about what we need to do or if i do this i do that then i'll get straightened out then i'll be okay grace is about done it's about what jesus has done for us on the cross grace is not about outward appearance grace is about an inward change in our side of ourselves where we renewed and revitalized in the spirit of jesus grace is not about religion grace is about a relationship where we have a relationship with him and we let him be the lord of our lives that's grace. Now look, I, I could sit up here and I could say, well, grace is this and grace is that. Uh, and here's uh, grace number four, grace number five, part five, part six, four, seven. I could do that all day, but it still wouldn't get to really understanding grace. Because grace, it's not enough to, to kind of intellectually understand grace. You have to really understand it by experiencing it. Let me just give you an example. So when I was a kid, growing up over at Wellston, I used to love to go fishing. Uh, anybody went fishing as a kid? Uh, and uh, it was always great because, you not, you know, if the fish weren't biting, uh, there were always uh, the kind of pond creatures that were running around, and one of the great things was they had all the frogs out there. Anybody ever seen a bullfrog? Anybody ever heard a bullfrog? You know, and there were all these bullfrogs that were around the ponds that I would go to. And I would watch them, and they'd be jump out in the water, and you know they'd be swimming along, or they'd be out on a lily pad, they'd be eating something, or they'd be sitting on the bank, and, or uh, or baby Yoda would be eating one, or something like that would be going on. For those of you who've been watching that, uh, but uh, I would like to get up, you know, kind of sneak up behind them, and then spook them. And what happened when they get spooked? You remember, you remember that? It's like boop, boop, boop. they ran. Uh, it was literally like they were running across the top of the water for a certain period of time, and they kind of sink into the water. That was a frog. And then when I got into high school, into high school biology class, 
I had an assignment, and what was the assignment in high school biology class? Anybody remember? Dissect the frog, right? And so you get the frog out, and you lay the frog on the board, and me and my teammate, Dana, we were, we, you know, well, somebody, was, I got to do all the cutting, but uh, we cut the frog open and lay the frog out, take the frog, put the parts out, and what have you, and we got our assignment done, and as we got our assignment done, I realized something. Knowing the parts of a frog is not the same thing as experiencing a living frog. You know? I mean, you can know all the parts of a frog, and it may be intellectual experience, but it's not the same thing as really living experience with a frog. That's the way it is with grace. You can know the parts of grace and not know anything about grace. You can know something about grace and not know anything about grace because you haven't experienced it. That's why, since grace is experiential, that's why in the New Testament it uses stories to communicate grace. And let me just give you an example of one story. So in the Gospel of John uh, and the 8th chapter, there's a story about Jesus one morning. He gets up early in the morning and he goes up into the temple of God and he's up there pretty early, and it says that the people decide they're going to get up there early too because they want to hear him teach, they want to hear him uh, speak, and so uh, they're up there listening to him. And this is early in the morning, and it says all of a sudden back there across the way somewhere, there was this kind of like angry mob of religious leaders that started coming in Jesus' direction. And they had this woman that was, well, you can imagine they're kind of like draped as best she could in maybe a, a sheet if nothing else. And she's being dragged across the, across the courtyard to Jesus. And they take this woman and they throw her down in front of Jesus. And she's being humiliated. She's being shamed. And the purpose of her being humiliated and shamed is to shame Jesus. Because yes, it's true that she's done something that she shouldn't do. And so the, so the religious leaders, they asked Jesus this question. Jesus, in the law of Moses, it says that such a woman who has committed adultery, as it was seen, she was caught in the very act of it. Jesus, such a woman should be stoned to death. What do you say? And here's this woman who's had probably the deepest secret of her life revealed, who's humiliated, who's shamed, and he looks at her, and then he looks at them, and he asks this question to get it off of the, is she guilty, is she not? Into a deeper level that they're all experiencing. He says, the challenge. Let the person who is without sin among you cast the first stone. And all of a sudden, we get out of the who's guilty and who's not into Are we all in the same boat? And it says that the beginning at the eldest, everybody else starts to just kind of fade out. Because they understand their guilt and their brokenness and their disconnection from God too. And he looks down at her and he says to her, who are those who condemn you? And she replies to him, they've all left. And the Son of God says to her, neither do I condemn you. And then he adds, go and sin no more. You understand what's happened? The worst day of her life, when her deepest secret has been revealed to everyone, and she's been humiliated and shamed in front of all these people, all of a sudden turns into the best day of her life. Because her secret is disclosed in the presence of Jesus. And through that, she receives God's grace. And the healing begins in her life. But undoubtedly, I would suggest, the greatest fear she had was that secret would be revealed. Now, reading this passage, I think that we all can relate to that because 
Well, a lot of times we have secrets that, that we don't want other people to know. Uh, let, let me just give you an example. Um, if you go back this afternoon and do a web search, I feel the same way, by the way. <laughs> Type in post secret, post secret, and look at what comes up, because what will come up there is a uh, project that was started, I believe it's in 2005, by this artist, and the artist was, uh, what he did was he, he got postcards, and he put a return address on the postcard, put a stamp on it, and put on this postcard this, you're invited to write on this postcard your deepest secret that you have told no one else, and then stick it in the mail and just return it, and this will be used as part of an art project. And he took 3,000 of these postcards and he, he left them all over the place in this city. And after a while, the postcards started coming in. And he used what he received as uh, books and also as art exhibits. Uh, and it was interesting what he got back. Because, for instance, one person said, my secret, her secret was, uh, I think that women who don't wear makeup are lazy. I'm thinking, that's your secret? <laughs> Uh, and then another one was, uh, I hate people who put me on group texts. And another one was, when I'm mad at my husband, I put boogers in his soup. <laughs> yeah, I ain't, I'm, not, I'm not eating at that woman's house, okay? Uh, and another one was, I wish my father had forgiven me before he died. And another one was, my husband doesn't know that he's raising his best friend's child. And another one was, when I sleep with my wife, I feel like I'm cheating on my lover. And another one was, when I eat, I feel like I'm a failure. That's the kind of stuff that people are bearing. And into that, Jesus walks. And he invites us to receive the same thing as that woman. To take our secrets and to openly put them before him and receive his grace. That's what grace is about. It's about being healed of the deepest wounds of our lives and being made whole. Anybody here have a secret you need to bring before him? Anybody here have a wound that you need healed? That's what his grace is for. Let's pray together. We praise you, Lord. We give you thanks for your great grace towards us. We admit that we run away from ourselves. We run away from you. We are sometimes not honest to you. Help us to be honest before you. Help us to lay our struggles and our secrets before you. And in that moment, receive healing and mercy from you. That grace upon grace may be poured into our lives and we may be made whole. We ask these things in your name. Amen.